<clears throat> for you, Wendy. Had you not become a journalist. Can you start again? I didn't hear the beginning for some reason. So just start okay. again. Okay. All right. All right. Starting again. Question. Question for you, Wendy. Had you not become a journalist, and I know this is so unthinkable, but <laughs> had you not, what else would you have become or would like to be? There's still time. Well, I still would like to be, but when I was a kid, I actually thought I could be like an artist. I could be a singer. Only um, people have pointed out that I have no talent. And then I thought, well, I could be a painter. Only I have no talent there either. So then... <laughs> A little bit more realistic. I, I think I would like, like I find the brain really interesting. So I'd like to be like a brain scientist without the going to university part. Oh Just, my God. <laughs> you know, like paying attention and studying and. Yeah. I'm really glad you became a journalist. Yeah. Well, that that's why I'm a journalist. Very short attention span. So I would have so, liked yeah. to have been a neuroscientist, but I don't want to go to school. <laughs> um, you? I always thought I would like to be an actor. I was an actor. I was a kid actor. And growing up, I thought this is all I wanted to be. But then, you know, I'm too bossy. I'd probably make a better director, but I also like security. Um, so hmm. uh, I would want to be, do something a little more structured. But I love being around performers and I love spectacle. And so I think I, uh, I would like to have been Melissa Bub Clark. Yeah. So Melissa Bob Clark, I think she has like a dream job. I mean, she's I really, she's a big deal in the industry, but she might not be super famous, um, but she's among, you know, other people, but she, Melissa Bob Clark, she's senior vice president of music and live events at Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. She programs, produces and promotes all those live events um, at Toronto Scotiabank Arena, um, which is like one of the big, big, huge venues in North America. So I don't know. Does I, that I, not sound like a... Yeah. Fun, big job. I mean, uh, you get to decide whether Madonna's coming to play, which she is, by the way, or Bruce Springsteen. And she also sits on the board of the Canadian Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences. They are behind the Junos. So she's plugged in, as they say. So I, she's going to be on the podcast. Do you, do you think we can get tickets? I wouldn't mind. She could probably help us. Well, she's probably heard that before, but I wouldn't mind getting tickets to Ricky Gervais. Like he used yeah. to be really funny. I'm not sure he's that funny anymore, but yeah. Who? who would yeah. You uh, well, I've, uh, who would I want to see? If, if, I don't know. Sam Smith. He's coming up as well. I'd have to look at the list, but you know what? I used to work in this industry and people like the radio and people were always asking you for tickets and, you know, even when I could get them and nobody can anymore, I didn't want to get them. And you get tired of asking. So, yeah, wrestling. Oh, well. I'd like to see the wrestling. <laughs> yeah, sure you would. And well, I'm all about the wrestling. Okay, well, I won't be asking for wrestling tickets. Well, any tickets now, I'll, I'll behave. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of challenges in the job. Like, like, what do you do when you have, when Madonna's coming? You know, you've got the whole concert, you've got the whole thing booked uh, way in advance. And then... The Maple Leafs make it to the Stanley Cup playoffs um, and they want to take over the arena. Then what do you do? You don't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> like, like maybe once yeah. every 20 years, but but no, there is a challenge there for sure. So uh, if I can't be Melissa Bub Clark, I think the next best person would be Melissa Bub Clark. And she's joining us today. Melissa. Hey, Melissa. Hello. Hey, hi. How are you? <laughs> Good morning. Hi. So can we're we not get, we're, not ask we're not supposed to ask about the tickets. So yeah. if you would like to go to wrestling at Scotia Baker Arena this Saturday, I can hook you up. <laughs> Maureen? <laughs> Maybe. Um, Come on. Can you so tell us what tell us how what you do? Like tell us, take us through what you actually do. Okay, so I work with an incredibly talented team at Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. So off the top, uh, you gave me that very generous introduction. And I am not responsible for, for some of those things, but I work with really talented people who are. So I get to oversee the live entertainment department. And what that means is our group is responsible for everything that comes into our venues that are not one of the teams, not Toronto Maple Leafs, Raptors, Argos, or TFC. So it so Madonna. Be Madonna could be wow. Disney events, could be wrestling. So we have a programming team and they would work hand in hand with the uh, industry. So promoters and their job is to really make sure our venues are as full and as busy as possible. 
And you mentioned off the top, if the Leafs are in a Stanley Cup run. So what that looks like is that programming team would have to work with the leagues and again, the promoters. And it's really, I always liken it to a game of Tetris. It is, if you think hmm. your calendar and your social life is insane, think of the calendar of the busiest arena in Canada. And they would work with everyone to slot it in. When is the team going to be away? When are they going to play at home? What dates are available for shows? Um, so that is a that is an incredible uh, feat in itself. And so then, do you like fight with a with the sports guy? Do they really want the Leafs people to like do well and go in the playoffs? And you're going, that will really screw up my <laughs> concert. <laughs> <laughs> no, we so we would work in advance. And Trisha Silliphant, who is uh, you know has been doing this for quite a while and oversees the programming team. She would have great relationships with them. And yeah, there definitely is a little bit of back and forth as we try and figure out what the schedule looks like. But anytime we would schedule an artist to come in in a playoff period, we communicate that. Mm -hmm. And there are certain parameters that we would put in place, you know, whether it be compensation, what other window could we move them to? Uh, so it's an ongoing discussion for sure. But I mean, man, oh, man, over the past few years, our, well, obviously, I mean, I sort of joke that if there's one time that is not sexy to be the senior vice president of music and live events, it's during a pandemic. Yeah. But yeah. since then, everyone is on the road. We knew this would happen. You know, everyone was writing and creating and have gone on the road. So um, scheduling in itself is is quite formidable. There, there's the production team and the production team, really, they work hand in hand with the tours to bring it all to life, the stage, the lights, the, the chair sets, et cetera. So all the sort of bricks and mortar of operations of bringing that show to life. And then finally, perhaps part of my portfolio, we are Live Nation Canada's uh, national sponsorship agency. So we would work with RBC and American Express and Rogers and Labatt and the likes to bring programs to life. Hmm. Live performance has uh, now we know that uh, with the sort of we don't want to say the demise of the recording industry, but uh, yeah, I'll say that. Sure. Um, <laughs> that live performance is how artists make their money now. Yep. Now more than ever. And so the shows have become bigger and more lavish with maybe the exception of Ed Sheeran, who blows everybody away all by himself. Uh, but do you find that and this is a really big question, Melissa, but do you find that live performance has become more or less important given you can see so much yourself online. I mean, I think we really, we, that was really underscored during the pandemic. So we pivoted like everybody else and we did bespoke content and online shows and digital and it was great. And in some ways, you know, that's a bit more equitable and accessible for someone who might live in Sault Ste. Marie and can't get to Toronto for Madonna. But I think what we really learned, which we kind of knew all along, truly, is that people want to be together. Like our ticket yeah. sales are out the roof. Um, you know, we come and, and, and probably why I've been in the industry for so long. Like it, I truly walk through the aisles and it might be a, it might be an artist that I personally don't listen to at home. But when I come to the arena and people like moms and kids are there, um, you know, best friends are there, couples are there, who, whatever it is. And they're they're in it. It it truly is never lost on me. So I I really believe that we've just learned more than ever that that live experience. There's honest. It's it it feels a bit future proof in a world where not much feels future proof. The live experience of doing something you love together, especially music, um, it feels a little bit future proof. I'm knocking wood. So expensive, though. I mean, yeah. I'm sorry to throw cold water on the on the whole idea because it it does. It sounds so great, and I'm not a big concert person, but my husband is, my my daughter is, but it's it's really expensive. So it's got it's got to be if you've got no money, it's got to be something that you save up for forever, or you got to have a lot of money. It's uh, it's really tough. Like how do you yeah. how do you get around that? How do you speak to people? People. <laughs> I mean, I feel so you're right. And for the AAA artists and when they come through, you know, the production of these events, like they are, they're expensive. They're expensive by all the crew that's behind the scenes. You know, there's, there's makeup, there's wardrobe, there's production, there's, there's all sorts of stuff. But I, I guess what I would say is, you know, again, for the AAA artists, for sure. But live music is actually quite 
accessible throughout the city, throughout the country. Um, you just might be seeing a local artist at a local venue. So for sure, you know, the big artists that come to Scotiabank Arena, um, although, you know, when you look at a scale ticket price, there are accessible prices. You might not be in the front row. Um, the wrestling, for example. Sorry. <laughs> Wendy is in wrestling. I can't wait. Are you our new wrestling influence? Yeah, me and Maureen, we're going to go. We're right? gonna, yeah, we just think it would be good a photo op. Yeah, not coming, no, but... not to dismiss wrestling but, uh, at all, because it has a huge following. But, you know, I'm going to tell, I, I'm old enough to tell you the first concert I saw was Elton John in Montreal at the Forum. And I paid for my ticket, which I think was maybe less than $20 out of my allowance. And it was in the most phenomenally elaborate show. Uh, the, this is the one where, you know, with the piano rises out and the, the top hat, the whole bit. And I, 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 that's probably going back to my original point was that concerts were more accessible because artists made money off selling records. And now it all has to come down to this. So is that the case? Or, I mean, or does the venue get blamed? I think, I mean, always. Um, I think that, you know, ticket prices have evolved, obviously, with the times and inflation and everything else. But I do think, you know, when I look at the sports side of the business, it's interesting to me because people don't really, my, my uh, husband and my son went to the Super Bowl this year. I mean, super privileged, amazing, incredible. And it was really expensive. And it's funny that no one talks about that in the same way that they do artists. And it's really, I do think that there's this perception and I actually think um, Amanda Marshall touched on it on your last podcast where that should be free or that should be more reasonably priced than anything else. But when you look at athletes in sports, like what people pay for games. Yeah. No, it's crazy. They're playing like 80 games, like Beyonce or Madonna. Like when was the last time Madonna was on tour? She's got five decades of music. Yeah, you. we are going to pay quite dearly for that. You know, she's not, she doesn't have 80 home games or sorry, 40 home games, but she's, you know, she's on the road um, every few years at best. And yeah, you do end up paying for that. But, you know, again, to accessibility. Yeah. So you're probably looking at maybe lesser known artists in some respects. Some, some major, you know, popular artists keep their ticket prices lower. Um, but, you know, and that's a whole other conversation, but I guess the issue when you get into that is that often people scoop up those tickets and they resell them for what yeah. the market can bear. And then, you know, Joe Smith is actually making the margin on that ticket, not the artist who should yeah. be compensated for their art. So do you go, do you go and, and hang out and like wink and make faces at Madonna or like, do you, is there someone, the wrestlers, do you, whatever? Do you meet, is there someone and meet any of the performers? Do you drop by and say, Hey, I'm, I'm Melissa. Sometimes. <laughs> I mean, I would say since the pandemic, you know, back of house and everything is, is, is probably a little bit more locked down than it was before for, mm. for obvious reasons and security, like, you know, and even people's access to digital, you, they don't want someone coming in and sneaking in a, a video, but you know, certainly over the course of my career, I've had some some great introductions. And sometimes it's just you know when you're about like I was walking not long ago. We had Post Malone, and I was walking to do something, and he just kind of went, you know, walking by. I mean, the friendliest guy. Hi, hi. hi. <laughs> hi <Christy>. <laughs> I mean, that's cool. It is cool. It is yeah. cool. Uh, what about when other so? And I've always wondered how this works. Like so. Some George Clooney, George and Amal come to town and they want to see Kiss and they would get in touch with your office. I mean, is, is that how that works? Because, you know, you see celebrities pop up all the time and you go, well, geez, did they get their tickets through Ticketmaster like me? Yeah, we have an incredible group um, in our ticketing team that would absolutely work with, you know, those types of requests and make sure that they're, if we can take care of them, that they are. And, you know, depending on what their security needs are and, and, and be able to facilitate that. And then sometimes Arranging the kiss cam, you need the kiss cam for George and Amel. <laughs> the kiss, kiss cam. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. Um, and then sometimes it would go directly through the artist and we hmm. would just hear, you know, through the promoter or the manager that so-and-so is coming tonight. And, you, you know, you can kind of tell when you see maybe some detail walking around or certain hmm. areas are, are locked down or yeah. 
What about riders? Do there are there still crazy riders? Like I know. Oh, that, like the uh, green jelly beans, you know? Well, no, 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 those were the brown smarties. But yeah. Oh. <laughs> so our production team, we definitely are event coordinators who have an incredibly long day. You know, they will be on the loading dock at, at four or five in the morning to to welcome the tour in, and then sort of work on on the ground to make sure that they have everything that they need. Um, they would definitely see some of that stuff. Still, you know, artists are can be particular about the environment they want or the temperature they need for their voice or, you know, they only want to drink or eat a certain thing. And, you know, which it, it, it is fun and it can be funny, but I certainly respect it because being on the road is no joke. Yeah. Like it, it's quite grueling. And I know that sounds like they get paid a ton of money and they have fame and fortune. And obviously they've chosen that life and that's incredible. But I do. um I do have a respect for it being so close to it that being on the road and arriving at an arena in a different city, you know, after a long either bus ride or, you know, plane ride or whatever it is. So I, I feel like having some of those comforts or whatever it is that makes you feel at ease, um, I can certainly see why that would be helpful. Just to, just to clarify, it's in case you haven't heard, it's an old story, um, but the Brown Smarties, I believe it was a Van Halen uh, rider in their contract that they wanted a bowl of smart, M&M's because yeah. the American, and they didn't want any of the brown ones in, they wanted all the brown ones taken out. And that <laughs> sort of became a legendary apocryphal story about how demanding they were, but what it, in fact it was, and Melissa's nodding her head, was it was put in there to make sure that they are reading the contract. And because there were other writers that were more important. So that's what, that was the reason behind that. So we'll excuse Van Halen for, for that, for that reason. But I agree with you, Melissa, like if I were on the road all the time and, and I like certain kind of wafers or whatever, I'd want those wafers with a special kind of water at a certain temperature in my room, which when you publish it and it sounds like a brown smarty, it sounds ridiculous, but it's uh, but it's not really. So tell us, what's your most ridiculous example? <laughs> that being said, <laughs> I, you know, we had an artist that would request like an all white room, meaning like all the all the decor needed to be like creamy. Had a white. boss like that once, <laughs> and beautiful. <laughs> so you know, or I, I, I would say the funny thing about the riders is that it they've definitely I, I think like they've evolved. So you know, 25 years ago, you might see some things in there that are like, hmm. now I honestly feel like it's more healthy food, access to a gym, like, the, yeah. you know, um, quiet, you know, a quiet room somewhere, somewhere to host friends and family. So I do think that it, it's maybe become a little less bananas and, and now a little bit more conducive to sustaining that lifestyle. Do artists still travel by bus? Is that still the sort of the romantic notion or, do the, or do, does the tour come in and the artists fly in or? Um... Like depends. in the movies, they're always on a bus. <laughs> yeah. um, I, it, it depends on the artist for sure. And, and you know, what their routing would be. Um, a lot of times you're right. It is, it would be the crew that are on the bus. Um, once in a while, you'll get an artist that comes in, but it's often, and, and you know, it's funny, like it, it is when we have shows in the winter, you know, you will hear well, that, you know, my team will be running around like crazy because the tour is late because they've hit crazy weather or like it is really quite interesting. The um, the the mechanics and operations of, you know, touring our big, vast country that experiences all seasons. Um, one of the funny things that I would have learned when I stepped into this particular role five years ago that I just wouldn't have never given some thought to is how much weight the roof can bear at the arena. Huh. So these tours have come in and, you know, as we set off the top, they've really evolved. And some of them, some of them are very stripped down and some of them are, you know, a mashup of Broadway, Cirque du Soleil, like they're, they're real uh, intricate events with m like massive loads that come in and lots of trucks. And um, there's a certain time in the winter, depending on the weight of everything that needs to hang from the roof, that we could only we can only bear so much or we need to look to route around because if snow falls and adds additional weight on the roof, then our capacity for the tour goes down. It's funny mm -hmm. things like that that I think, you know, well, our counterparts in Florida don't have to. No, they about. don't have to deal with that. Wow. <laughs> yeah. 
I was reading, I don't know very much about sports and I don't know very much about concerts and stuff either. So I was reading about MLSE and all the names that came back, like the Harold Ballards and the John Bassett's and the, and the story of the Leafs and the, you know, the Con Smythe and the Maple Leaf building and the history of the Maple. Well, we can talk about Maple Leafs after if you <laughs> don't want to. Um, but it, it's fascinating because it's such an old boys world that you entered. And I, and I know that Maureen hates it when we get into sort of stereotypical feminist uh, narratives but but it is kind of an old boys world and now it's it's changing and you're a young woman it's it's kind of it's kind of cool especially when you look at the history of MLC it was all like sort of old gnarly boys old white guys <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, MLSC is such a storied, you know, organization. We kind of joked that it's the most um, public private company, you know, mm. it's, 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 yeah, it's got such an incredible history. And yeah, it's certainly, I mean, sports and live entertainment historically have been very you know, male dominated. I, I can't speak for the recording side of it. I, I know my peers in it, but I've always been in the live music sector and it is very male dominated. I would suggest, yeah, that is certainly starting to change. When I look back, when I started 25 years ago, and I think of my journey, um, I, you know, started as receptionist and then I got a job as the uh, marketing assistant. And I didn't really think outside of those opportunities. And, it, you know, it's true. We talk a ton. Everyone talks a ton about representation. And I can really identify with that because I didn't, I wasn't sad or upset. I just didn't really think jobs like outside of those types of roles were available to me. And then the more I was in it, then I was like, oh, well, maybe I'll do that. And maybe I'll move into that. But yeah, I would say for both sports and entertainment, thankfully, we're getting to a point where you see more women in it. I, I, you know, a lot of it is I would, you know, from a live entertainment perspective, it's a grueling schedule. I'm out a lot of nights and weekends. Um, that doesn't work for many people. If you're a single parent or if you've got kids, you know, it, it's definitely a choice you make. Uh, thankfully. Well, now you've got all these titles, like your senior VP at MLSE. It's a, it's a, it's like a very, it's, it's like a big, huge job. So good for you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. I feel incredibly lucky. Um, I feel very grateful to my younger self who, when I told my parents that I was going to take a job as, as a receptionist at a new startup concert promoter, and listen, that's a totally respectable gig. I had just uh, graduated from university and they were like, are you sure that's the direction you want to go mm. in? And I just was like, yeah, I think I can make something of it. I think it's going to be fun. <laughs> so you couldn't sing either. <laughs> like honestly, I have zero talent. Like I, I can't sing, I can't hold a note. I, I can't play an instrument. So I sort of always joke that the way I got into it was I, I could figure out the business side of it a little bit. What is your what is your uh your degree in? Oh geez, I went to Carleton University. So did I. And I took did you? Yes. Nice. Go Ravens. And I took um, <laughs> I took a degree in mass communication and sociology. <laughs> wow. Well, I just, I started in journalism and switched to film studies. Uh, at, well, that's uh, relevant at, to where it yeah. to, to Well, I guess it is. But I, it's funny that uh, the reason why I ask you this is my old, oldest son, who's 30 now, he went to Western and he took, he was at Ivy Business School. But what he really wanted to do was work for MLSE. Okay. He's a, a sports fanatic and yes. he actually did have a couple of interviews, but the, the entry level level jobs where he couldn't afford to take them. And, and I think, you know, he's, he's very successful now, but it was his dream. And the fact that you came out of school and took a job as a receptionist, and I can see your parents going, really? Uh, but it worked out for you. And maybe that's something that a lot of people who want these big dream jobs have need to realize is you really do have to work your way up. It's not going to be handed to you. I mean, I'm sure I, you know, you both have such incredible careers. Like, yeah, I think that's true for most of us is, you know, you step in with humility, you work your butt off. That's what I tell, I have a 17 year old and a four, 14 year old and um, our 17 year old is just wrapping up grade 11. So she's starting to think about, you know, what post-secondary could look like. And it's funny because, you know, um, when they were younger, they didn't really know or care what I did. <clears throat> now they're a little bit older and they, they have some appreciation and they want to go to shows and every once in a while I get a text from my daughter, like so-and-so wants to know what you did in school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I kind of laugh a little bit. I'm like, well, I took, although <clears throat> I will give all the credit in the world when I was in my fourth year of university, write my thesis. 
and I started doing a project on women's studies um, in Africa. And my professor, Professor Magnoni, I think he's since passed on, but I started writing my thesis and I thought, you know, I actually want to write my thesis on the tragically. <laughs> 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 it was a so real, different. <laughs> real, real left turn, there. real pivot, real yeah, pivot, real pivot. I was pivoting long before pivoting was a thing. And um, yeah, I don't know. One night I was just, and this is maybe the beauty of youth. I, I, I didn't really overthink things sometimes in the way that I do now, but I thought, you know, my favorite band and they were really, really popular in Canada. They weren't as popular outside of Canada. What did, you know, the sociology, what did, what did Canadian and Canadian-ness have to do with all that? And, I and, to, and what's, what's that? the answer? What's the answer? Cause oh, they, that, they, that's, that's like a 30 page paper, <laughs> okay. that's a thesis, which I'm happy to share with you. Um, but I went to my professor and I said, listen, I'm thinking of doing this. And he was like, absolutely. That's what hmm. you should do. You should hmm. go for it. And, um, I honestly think without that, I don't know that I would have found this because I started doing information interviews within the industry and talking to certain people. And it was so funny because so many of the people that I had reached out to, you know, they were a bit, um, I don't know if jaded is the right word, but they were very, you know, they were generous with their time, but they were also like, this isn't all fun and games, you know, like it's really hard to do this and this isn't all fun and games. And I kind of thought again, in my whatever 21 year old self, I was like, what a downer. You all are. <laughs> like, well, it's amazing how brave we are when we are briefly, perhaps when we're teenagers or 21. Cause one of my first jobs was answering the freaking phone at chum. And you walked yeah. in and you said, I got an album. Will you play my album? The guy is like, well, you showed up, you're in person, you're 12, but I'll play your album because you showed up. So I think it is all, you know, and I got paid, I don't know, $4 an hour for answering the phone. And it was a joke, but it led to one thing that led to another thing that led to another thing. And answering I think the phone people unite. Like yeah, exactly. No, my first job was, a, uh, was as a receptionist as well, but it was in a construction company. So it didn't get Really yeah, you got to start somewhere. So, so now I, I read that you, you, uh, what are you? You're one of the most powerful women in uh, 2021. So when, when it's 20, when, sadly, it's 2023. So, yeah. way oh, so, so now you're venerable, <laughs> way less powerful today. Sorry, but now you're a woman of ill repute. So I mean, this is sort of how we got the woman of influence, women of ill repute. It's kind of the same, same thing. So, I'm so yeah. That. I have, I'm going to be, I just want to ask you, I'm going to tell you, first of all, when you mentioned the tragically hip, that was my, I saw the last show at, uh, at Dang. Scotia Bank before they went to Kingston for, and it was, okay. and it was, a. I bought the tickets as a gift for my husband. And so the most money I've ever spent on tickets, because they were really good and it was the best show. And, you know, mm -hmm. I started crying in the parking lot. And just cried all the way through. And I've seen other shows since then, but that is one of the most intimate experiences you can have in a venue that size. I was going to ask you, what's you, what's your favorite? What or name one of your top five shows? So it's funny that you say that. Um, honestly, mine would be, and I've had the privilege of seeing like literally hundreds, if not maybe into the thousands of shows Jeez. over the last twenty five years. But the one that sticks out is uh, I was fortunate enough to see the tragically in Kingston. So for that very oh, last you show. saw the, I just got goosebumps. So you saw the show yeah. after that, and you yeah. know the, the things I remember is the venue was a million degrees, and we were so to your point about intimacy, we were you know thirteen, fourteen thousand people together, maybe a little less uh, in, in Kingston, but we were together, and people were laughing and crying and singing, and I couldn't believe that Gore Downey was mustering this courage and energy and the entire band actually to do this sort of live love letter to Canada. And I remember being in that moment thinking, this is history. It's so special. And I will remember this forever. So I would say that would be, I, I've, again, I've had the privilege of seeing some incredible stuff, but that would be definitely at the top of the list. I'm getting choked up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I felt that I felt not not as um, I didn't have as much of a history, but my daughter and I went to see Stevie Nicks last night. And oh, wow. I love her. Yeah. That's very old time. I'm glad your daughter was was into it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everybody loves Stevie. Yeah, she's she's she loves she's she's she loves all the cool kid stuff, but she loves Fleetwood Mac for sure. 
and um, the end, Stevie sang Landslide. Of course. And she had photos of Christine McVie up the whole time. And I just like, I started weeping because she was so incredible and vulnerable. And, you know, she does that night after night and she still managed to make you feel that, you know, she was sort of doing that for the first time. And when you find, when you see an artist who's able to, to, to do that, like it's just lightning in a bottle. I introduced Fleetwood Mac at Maple Leaf Gardens. Wow. I came, you know, was come out, this is a long time ago. And I just came out and was like, hi everybody, I'm Maureen Holloway, CKFM. And, I remember and here's days. Fleetwood Mac. And then there was 15 minutes goes by before they come out. <laughs> I remember those days when we would go to the radio stations and we would ask the very popular um, DJ, DJs and broadcasters to come, to come out, yeah. and do the introduction. But I wanted the band to start as soon as I said, Fleet yeah, Mac, but instead I had to sort of trot off the stage and everybody started grumbling. Didn't sing. No. <laughs> no. Well, just a little warm up act before the big band comes on. Drop the mic. Yeah. Each to his own. Uh, or her own. Melissa, you're an absolute joy to talk to. Thank you so much for taking us backstage, as it were. So I don't get to ask her about why is everybody still obsessed with the Maple Leafs? (laughs) (laughs) That's the sports side. I think we've established that's the sports side. Yeah, so she can say whatever she wants, right? Because she's the the entertainment girl. Yeah, go Leafs go. That is a real generational, like it is so, it's, 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 insane to me where you know i you travel you go and people are in a leafs jersey they are yeah yeah it's, well you see it, 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 it unites us in our in our constant heartbreak it it unites us and you know you again you think of as you know canadians that's a long winter that we go through and and yeah it really brings people together and seeing generations to come into it and it was great when the raptors came online and you know yeah. I don't know. I think all that stuff makes Toronto pretty badass to have, you know, a really legendary NHL team and an NBA team and all the shows that we get to bring here. Our city certainly punches above our weight with regards to all well, of you're that. You're so positive. You're so optimistic. It's it's lovely. And um, yeah, you got a lot of syllables in your in your title, which is great. And uh, <laughs> it's been lovely talking to you, Melissa. And, yeah, uh, thank you, Melissa. And we won't we won't bug you for tickets. <laughs> <laughs> wrestling. I thought we were going to wrestling on Saturday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks so much. Again. Thank you. Can I quickly tell you one thing? Of course. I just wanted to say that um, Wendy, this is kind of funny. So last summer we have since bought a place in Prince Edward County. Oh. And we were my husband and I, our kids were at camp, and we went out. We were staying at the Royal Hotel in Picton. And yeah, I, was I live in Picton. You she do? Knows. Yeah. Okay. I okay. Got it. So I um I went. We went across the street to um what's it called Russ and Co. Yeah. And the bar. we had like an extra drink, and we were feeling a little. And then I looked over and I saw you, and I said to my husband, I was like, Aww. that's Wendy. Oh, <laughs> you should have said hello. My brother had such a crush on you. <laughs> Oh well, that's better. And your and your brother's not like a hundred because I was like so offended when everyone said, "Oh, my dad thinks you're." I'm like your dad. No, no. <laughs> my dad thinks you're hot. Yeah. No, no, it was my brother. Anyway, we had this like celebrity sighting in Picton, and we were so excited. And Maureen, of course, I've heard your voice on the radio for a million years. This is a real uh, privilege for me. So thank you well, so much. Well, it's, it's just been lovely to have you. And say hi to ever. Say hi to Brendan Shanahan. Say hi to Julie Adam. I will. More. Yeah. Oh. No, a yeah. lot she's of your, your, your boss. Uh, Who's uh, Julie? No, she's not at Universal. She's but she's like on uh, on the board at Karis as well. So yeah, huh. she's lots of people of in board. common. What's that? The chair of that board. She's the chair of the board. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You remind me quite a bit of her, or oh. she reminds me of you, and I mean that, that it was a huge compliment. Um. All right. Great to talk to you. Yeah. Great thank you so talk much. To you. Thank you both. Hey. Okay. Yeah. Bye Good now. Bye. So, Maureen, did you notice I, I snuck in one question about women? Yeah, no, it's not, you know, I'm good. Just to clarify, and, I, and I'm preaching to the choir because you know what I mean. It's not that I, I don't like to ask women uh, about the work life balance. Um, no, I don't like to ask. Women about women, <laughs> but because I just think it's something that you would not ask a man. Yeah, and yes, yeah. she's got two young children. This is Melissa's two young children and a big job. 
but nobody says to a man, wow, you have two kids and a big job. How do you do it? (laughs) (laughs) And I mean, the truth is, and there, it is a bigger challenge for women because no matter what, we're still the ones that do or care most about housework. And we're still with young children, more responsible for their upbringing. You can't get away from that. It's a biological imperative. So it's a valid question. I just, I just No, no, I know. I'm I'm sort of kidding and sort of not because I mean, Melissa is a little bit younger than than I am than than we are, um, and yet she still felt the pressure of being, you know, of having her kids be with a nanny in the in the uh, in the yeah. program, or taking so it, taking being criticized for having help. Yeah, so it's it's still a thing, which is why we still, at least, is why I think I still talk about it. But I agree with you; we're not like for for me. I used to do speeches until <clears throat> Marie Hennon, who was on the podcast a thousand years ago when we first. Oh, it was only last ago. year. <laughs> oh, was it? Yeah, well, life goes quickly. Um, and she pointed out look, exactly what you're saying. It's so ridiculous. Like, uh, how many times do I get asked to speak about work-life balance at men's conferences? Like, never. Never. They have men's conferences? Yeah, yeah, they beat drums or something. <laughs> in the woods. I, don't, I don't know what they do. She <clears> anyway, a, she's, she's a lovely, accomplished woman who has a really interesting job. And I, I, I'm... I'm happy for her because uh, I was going to ask her, what do you want to do next? But what else would you want to do? Be a singer. 